Do you remember being a child this time of year? The anticipation and magic filled the air. And you stayed on your best behavior, of course. The days were long, which meant lots of creativity. What is it about this season that is so marvelous? When was the last time that you stopped to wonder? Hey, good morning. You guys doing good? It is good to see you guys. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors around here. Uh, this is only my third time coming to hang out with you guys, but I love getting the chance to hang out uh, with just all that God's done through LifeBridge and, and this adoption process. And we're just excited that our, our 242 family continues to grow and that you and I get to continue to get to know each other and celebrate this very important time of the year. So I'm glad that you're here for what is now week three of this series called Wonder, where we have been kind of just pushing you and wanting to hope to help you recapture some of the wonder that just came so natural to you and I when we were kids at this season of the year, right? This was absolutely a magical time of the year, not only because we had Christmas gifts under a tree and not only because we'd be getting out of school really soon for a couple of weeks and not only because there was always the hope of a snow day, there's just something magical about this time of year, but the truth is there's just something actually quite magical and supposed to like inspire some wonder within all of us because of this story. But you and I, uh, we, we have this kind of habit of as we get older, we exchange wonder for worry. In fact, some of the very same things that used to like create this sense of awe within us are now the very things that we worry about. We worry about the weather. We worry about what we'll get or if we'll have enough or if we'll get the kids what they want. We worry about the pressures at work or the family strife or the, the financial stresses that we're under. We worry instead of just being captivated by a sense of wonder at this time of year. And if we're not careful, we can lose our whole sense of just joy and peace and enjoying what the season is supposed to bring us. Now, if you're like me, you didn't grow up with a smartphone. And so just as a side note, do you remember when we were growing up and we used to just wonder stuff and we never knew the answer to it? And we were totally fine with that. Like, well, I remember being a kid and my friend would be like, yo, I wonder blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, yeah, I wonder that too. And then we would just move on with our life <laughs> completely content having no idea what the answer to that thing was. And that was fine. We didn't ask Siri or Google anything ever. And I don't, I don't know why it annoys me, but like my own kids all the time will be like, Dad, I wonder something, usually a stat about an athlete. And I'm like, yeah, I wonder that too. And they'll be like, well, can I have your phone and look it up? And I'm like, no, just embrace wonder, son. You don't have to know everything. <laughs> just relax. Like, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know why it bothers me, but it does. Anyway, we are hoping to help you recapture this sense of wonder, at least from the biblical perspective and so let's begin here. Let's define the word wonder. This has kind of set the course of this whole series, kind of the lens that we're trying to look at this, this uh, Christmas story through this year. Wonder, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration. Uh, that admiration, that sense of, of surprise and wonder is caused by something that is beautiful, unexpected, inexplicable, or unfamiliar. And so each week we've kind of looked at one of those words. The first week was beautiful. So how we got here is we said the way to capture the wonder and get a hold of it is to see that Christmas is just a part of the creation account according to John chapter 1. And that the very same God who spoke everything into existence stepped into this world and put on this flesh. And so like to understand the creation story and the beauty of it helps us understand our origin and the perfection that we were made from which is why it helps us understand now why we always expect and want perfection, even though we have never experienced it. We've experienced no perfect relationships, no perfect intimacy, no perfect trust, no perfect communion with God, and yet we all want it. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the beauty of the creation account. Now, last week we looked at that word unexpected, the unexpected pain, struggles, and trials that we go through in life. That there are many parts of the Christmas story that are very unexpected, and it's why Jesus came was to give us hope in the midst of the unexpected pieces. And now this week, we want to just talk about that word inexplicable. When we read the Christmas story, it's not supposed to be totally explainable. It's not supposed to totally make sense. Many of us have lost our sense of wonder because we have tried to answer all of the questions instead of pausing and just enjoying the mystery of what it is to be in relationship with the infinite. 
to just be caught up in the mystery of the wonder of what it is to believe that we are in communion with the Creator. That when we pause and pray and close our eyes, we are talking to the, the originator who spoke all of the cosmos into existence. That's never supposed to totally make sense. There's supposed to be this sense of wonder and awe as we, the, the finite, try to relate with the infinite. And too many times we miss the wonder and the beauty of all the inexplicable that is God. Or, or if you're a Princess Bride fan, the inconceivable, right? The like, we just can't explain it. We don't have the answer. So let's, let's start here. What makes a good story? Like when you read a story, what makes stories great? What makes novels classics what is it about a story, a movie that you watch, that makes it great? It always boils down to just a couple simple elements. There's always a protagonist. There's always an antagonist. There's always a good guy, and there's always a bad guy. There's always a hero, and there's always a villain who are engaged in some form of conflict. Those are the only stories worth reading or watching. Who would Superman be without Lex Luthor? Who would Cindy Lou Who be without the Grinch? Who would Harry Potter be without the one whose names you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to say, man? Uh, right? We would never pay to go watch a movie about only Luke Skywalker. And let's just be honest, I don't feel like we talk about this enough. What would the NFL be without Bill Belichick? Like, he's totally the personification of the devil, maybe. Anyway, you can't be that good without selling your soul out, I, I feel like, but I might be wrong. Don't quote me. That's, I'm just joking in case someone's like serious. Um, but you shouldn't be that big of a Patriots fan anyway. Anyway, it's always funny to me when Michigan pops up as like the place that always loves the Patriots as much as New England. I'm like, guys, just because Tom Brady went to Michigan does not make you a Patriots fan. Anyway, you know, all right, I'll keep it to myself. But my point is this. What makes a great story is that there is a protagonist and an antagonist like engaged in a conflict. Conflict makes great stories. We know that intuitively when we read them, what we don't like is that that is also true about our own lives. We don't want the conflict, but what if that's the very thing that makes life worth living, is understanding yourself in relation to the ultimate protagonist and the effects of the ultimate antagonist. To really understand the wonder and the inexplicable beauty and the mystery of all that Christmas is about is you have to understand the background story of the protagonist God who created and spoke perfection into existence. And the sin and the brokenness of an evil one who has messed that up. See, Christmas, kind of the untold version of the Christmas story is it really is a story of a hero and a villain engaged in war. And it is a war that began long before Luke 2 or Matthew chapter 2 and the kind of normal Christmas stories that we read around this time of year. Now Christmas is a particular important battle scene in this cosmic war. In fact, Christmas is a turning point in the war story, but Christmas is a war story. And if you miss this, you miss a lot. So let's begin kind of here today, and then I'll show you this. The first kind of thing for us just to get our heads around is this simple truth. So much about the birth of Jesus is inexplicable. Again, you're not supposed to read the story and be like, that totally makes sense. Like, you know you've been around church and the Christmas story too long when we say a virgin gave birth and you're like, yep, that's just part of the story. That makes no sense. <laughs> do you know in the first century, virgins gave birth to babies at the exact same rate they still do today? <laughs> Zero. Zero. The story is an invitation into the mystery of a God who works beyond what we think is, is, is possible, beyond what we think we can do or what we can understand. It's an invitation out of the questions that we have and into the mystery and the wonder of a God who's working behind the scenes. And if we could just imagine for a moment what it was like the night of the first Christmas in the spiritual realm, what was happening. Matthew tells us that there was a host of, of angelic presence, of heavenly angels present, they came and made the first announcement and proclamation of the arrival of the Messiah to some shepherds on a hillside. Every time I read that, I'm always like, why did they need a host of angels to do that? It seems like one angel was enough. But what if there was a host of them because 
The untold part of Christmas is there is this huge spiritual battle between the angelic and the demonic happening over that nativity scene that night. I mean, I remember when the Passion of the Christ movie came out. That, that leaned into this, like, the spiritual realm part of what was happening at the Easter story. And I remember, that, you remember, like, back when that came out, everyone was kind of freaking out and talking about a ton in our culture. There was this show that they interviewed some religious leaders about their opinions of Mel Gibson and the movie and what they thought. And one religious leader was furious that Mel Gibson ha- had turned the, the crucifixion of Jesus into this universal clash between good and evil. This was the quote. I can't believe they turned the death of Jesus, a good moral teacher, into something with a cosmic scope, something with universal forces at work. Like, did you go to Sesame Street Seminary? Like, that doesn't make any, what did you think was happening in the story? Why would God become like us and, and, and go to work at this? Here, here is a better summary verse from Scripture of what Christmas is about. Because if I were to ask you, give me one Bible verse that summarizes Christmas, you might say John 1.14. That, that the word God put on flesh and dwelt among us. So you might quote like John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Let me give you a different and what I would say is a more accurate summary of Christmas from 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Like let us not miss the point. Let us not turn this into cute traditions and nativity scenes and miss the more cosmic reality of what was happening. Jesus didn't come just to teach us some good lessons, and he didn't come just to heal the wounds in our lives. He came to destroy the devil's work. That is not hallmark sounding, right? That is not like a Norman Rockwell holiday painting, Christmas is an invasion, It is part of a war story. And while we don't necessarily like to talk about cosmic forces of evil, how else can we really explain poverty and greed and racism and murder and abuse that has been true through all societies in human history? See, this is a war story, and if we miss that, we miss a lot. And think about the Christmas story itself. We looked at this last week. There are casualties even in the story. If you missed last week, we looked at some of these unexpected consequences when the, 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 the forces of this world were fighting back against the arrival of the Prince of Peace. We looked at how King Herod, who worked for the antagonist, was threatened hearing the arrival of a baby who, who was thought to be the king of the Jews, the Messiah, who, who met all the prophetic things that the Jewish people had been yearning and hoping for. And upon being threatened and uh, intimidated in his own reign, he ordered the murder of all boys two years old and younger that lived in Bethlehem and its vicinity. Those are casualties of a war story. You think, like, we don't like to think of this when when we're singing Silent Night. We don't like to think of this when we're sipping on eggnog around our Christmas trees. But this is why this story is so important to us, because there's cosmic things at play. And though we don't like to talk about it, we just want to think of sweet baby Jesus. There's also genocide as part of the story. It's a war story. And if we ignore that and we ignore it, then we, we might unintentionally take Christ out of Christmas. And what Christ means is the anointed one. He was anointed to win this war. And we don't like to talk about the devil around Christmas time. Some of you are already going, man, I should have gone somewhere else today, right? <laughs> Sorry. It hasn't even gotten totally awkward yet. Just buckle up because I'm, <laughs> I'm taking you somewhere. Just hang with me. But we don't like to talk about the devil. We don't even like to think of the devil. We like to think of the devil as like this cartoon character as not something real. We like to think of like Uncle Sam is the personification of patriotism. So the devil is this like cartoon personification of evil. But that is not what scripture teaches us. He is real. He is bad. And he really hates you. See, the truth that the Bible teaches is that he's a literal being. That he's called by many names, Satan, prince of darkness, father of lies, accuser of the saints, the thief, a roaring lion, a dragon, and my personal favorite, Belzebub. It's an interesting one. I imagine like in the ancient world it had more like of an edge to it, but it just sounds like a clown name. 
But the Bible teaches us that he was an archangel in heaven who in jealousy of who God was tried to dethrone God and took a third of the angelic forces with him. You talk about an antagonist. It's the story behind the story of Christmas that you can't just read the story of Christmas in Matthew chapter 2 or in Luke chapter 2. You also have to read it to fully understand it, to step into the wonder of all that is not explainable about it and read it from Revelation chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open up to Revelation chapter 12. We'll put the verses up on the screen if you don't. And like I said, we're now getting to the more awkward part of the sermon. We believe that all scripture is God-breathed and given to us with an authority from God to guide us. And so this is the Christmas story uh, according to a different part of scripture, one that maybe you haven't read very much that we definitely don't talk about usually around Christmas time. But here's what it says. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. So this is not literal. This is meant to be read as as God had given a vision to John uh, of what was happening in the spiritual realm that night of Christmas. So a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to the son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to the throne. Not exactly what we like to think of as Christmas. It's the most Wonderful time of the year. Come on, you know it. The red dragon's angry and he's going to eat her baby, so be of good cheer, right? You'll sing that this week and you're welcome. That is part of the Christmas story, you guys. Like that is not how we like to think of it, is it? That this picture is more of what's, what Christmas really looked like as weird. Like, that's the kind of thing you see spray, like airbrushed on the side of like a creepy van. <laughs> and that is Revelation's version of the Christmas story. Nobody wants to sing about that, but that's the truth behind the real importance of the Christmas story, which leads us to the second thing, and this is why this matters so much, is that Jesus came to win this war. That's why he came. It's why the story is so potent and powerful. It's why it flipped history upside down. It's why we return to it every year to come back to the truths. The power that is inside of this story and how it applies to our lives is that Jesus came to win. The Christmas is about remembering that Jesus ultimately won the war against sin and death and hell and the grave. And if I had my way, every nativity scene would look a little more like this with a big red dragon hanging out over top of the baby to remind us of the more cosmic truth. And what if, you guys, what if part of the reason that we've lost some of our wonder around Christmas is that we've just sanitized it? We've just domesticated it. We've commercialized it. We've made it innocent. We've made it just for kids. We've stolen from it the very power that the story claims. We've just tried to make it logical and explainable when it is not that easy of a story to just retell and have some kids dress up like shepherds and sheep. It is more potent than that. It is the story of Christ who was anointed to when the war arrived. I I like this quote from John Eldridge. He says this, To live in ignorance of spiritual warfare is the most naive and dangerous thing a person can do. It's like skipping through the worst parts of town late at night, waving your wallet above your head. It's like walking into an ISIS training camp with an I Love America t-shirt. It's like swimming with the great white sharks dressed as a wounded sea lion. Let me tell you something. You do not escape spiritual warfare simply because you choose not to believe that it exists or because you refuse to fight it. Jesus said that Satan has has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I ask you, why, why don't we expect the devil to steal our peace and kill our joy and try to destroy 
our relationships at Christmas time? I mean, why don't we give him more credit that he is due than being frustrated with ourselves or with God or our circumstance or our government or the world around us than calling out the one enemy we have been given the name of that we are against who Jesus has come to win? This is the way the Apostle Paul points us to this truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And I know this is not very Hallmark Christmassy. <laughs> Some of you are like, I should have just watched Joel Osteen this morning or something. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is good news. This is actually great news because it means in your marital issues, your enemy isn't your spouse. And that that enemy would love to play on your insecurities and your mistrust and tell you lies that are not true about who God is or who your spouse is. It means you and your spouse are actually allies in a common fight against a different enemy who is not each other. It means you don't have to fight against the people in your past who have wounded you. You don't have to fight against the people that you work with that try to hold you down. You have one enemy. You do not have to fight against the, the Republicans or the Democrats. So your war is not in the 2020 election. Praise God. Jesus, they didn't create this mess and they can't fix it. Our enemy is the devil and we are fighting a different battle. Now, let me try to explain it this way. How many of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? You know that movie? Super good. Haven't seen it. It's very Christmassy. You should watch it later today. But <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible darkness of the reality of war. And the opening scene is gut-wrenching because they begin at D-Day. D-Day was the strategy because Hitler and the Nazis had occupied and conquered all of Europe. And they knew if they do not create a beachhead, a place, a fortified, secure place, that they can begin to send in troops and supplies to Europe, they would not win the war. And so D-Day is a day with enormous casualties as wave after wave of allied forces stormed the beaches to try to establish and win the war. And that day, they were not just victorious. What's crazy is really that was the turning point in the entire war. It would be more than a year later when victory would finally be had and they would finally surrender. But, but basically, the war was won on D-Day. And, and here's what I'm trying to help you see today is that Christmas is D-Day in the story. Christmas is the day that Jesus invaded and established a beachhead in this world of hope and truth to resource us to live with the, the, the connection to our creation account with the hope of heaven someday. It's because we can hope because of Christmas. And the greatest amount of casualties in World War II happened between D-Day and the day of victory because it's then that the enemy sensed they were losing and they fought back the hardest. They gave it everything that they had but it didn't matter because they had basically already lost the war. And some of you are in the midst of crisis this Christmas. And the enemy is fighting back the hardest because D-Day already happened. Christmas happened. Easter happened. The death and the resurrection of Jesus was a clear shot across the bow of our enemy that the battle has already been decided. And we get to live in the anticipation of a someday where all war will be gone, but today live in the hope that if our marriage isn't going so well or our kids are falling off the deep end or we're a financial just crisis or we look in the mirror and it's like our whole body seems to be falling apart or all of our relationships are dying or our hope feels dead, or we carry around baggage and relationship wounds, that Christmas is a reminder that the evil one has already lost. It's the reason this baby was born, that you and I can live from and fight from a place of victory. So that's the third thing I wanted to tell you guys today. This is why this matters. It's not just to understand the backstory or what's happening in the spiritual realm on Christmas, but it's to understand the spiritual realm of your own life. That what Christmas accomplished is so that you and I can live from a place of victory. And that when we fight in our marriages for its future, we fight from a place of victory. When we fight to work on our own character and our own flaws, our own self-confidence, we fight from a place, we live from a place, we work from a place of victory. This is the way 1 John chapter 4 says it. It says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This 
is the spirit of the Antichrist. Again, there's so much in Scripture pointing us to the spiritual realm, but we live, and most of us have grown up in a Western culture, it's very spiritually illiterate. So we don't pay attention to it, and it all just seems like cartoon to us, but the Scripture constantly brings us back to its reality. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, the antagonist of the story, which you have heard is coming and is now already in this world, but you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in this world. The protagonist, the the God who self-sacrificed and died for his enemies, those of us who believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the spirit of that God has taken up residence within us. That spirit that has overcome the world, that spirit that raised him from the dead now is within us so that we can live and fight from a place of victory. That while we don't have the ultimate victory of heaven yet, we live in the anticipation of it that someday all war will be gone and forgotten. No more tears, no more fatherless kids, no more broken marriages. I I love this quote from Plato. He said that only the dead have seen the end of war. And when Plato said that, he was referring to like physical war, but it's true of spiritual warfare as well. And just in case some of you are like, man, Kevin is so well read, he's quoting Plato. I do want to be honest and tell you where I got that quote from. It's from Call of Duty. Uh, when you die, they put these pithy sayings on the, sta- on the screen, and that was one of them, and it stuck with me. So I just don't want you to think something that's not true about me. Um, we are invited to live from a place of victory and the hope of a someday where all war will be gone. And now before any of us march out of here, ready for war, and go buy a gun, pull our kids from school, move to the woods, start churning our own butter... I want you to back up a second and hear me. That Jesus' invasion was an invasion of love. What he came to do was not what anyone expected. What they wanted was a Messiah who would come and create and lead a mighty military and overthrow Rome, but that is not how the real war would ever be won. Not then and not now. What Jesus came and established was a beachhead of a war that was won through love. Napoleon Bonaparte once said this talking about Jesus. Napoleon, terrible person, said this. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But what foundation did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love, and at this hour millions of men would die for him. See, Jesus' daring night raid that we know as Christmas The only blood that would be shed for this invasion and war would be his own, and the only casualty would be his own life. Because he knew that the territory that needed to be reclaimed was not of soil or land or geography, but of the human heart. That is why this baby was born. That is what he came to do. And there are many of you today that just need to be reminded of that truth. It's simple, but it's powerful. I'll I'll tell you this way. As we were talking about Christmas this year, God took me back in my own life when I learned this in a very kind of tangible way. 15 years ago, my wife and I, we were finishing up our degrees, and we, had, we were in our first year of marriage, and so I was taking a couple classes in the morning, and then I would go to work from noon until 10 at night at this call center, so she couldn't like get a hold of me during the day. And so one night, I get off work at 10 o'clock, and my wife is there in the parking lot waiting for me. Like She's like, surprise, we're going on a date. And like the whole thing was just really weird, because I'm like, one, like, my car's here, I don't need you to pick me up, and it's also 10 o'clock at night, and, like, even when we were in college, we didn't start anything at 10 o'clock at night, like, we slept at 10 o'clock at night, right? So she's trying to act like, no, this is totally normal, we're going on a date, so we went, as you do, to Steak and Shake, it's like 10, 20 a night, and we're sitting there, I'm like, what is going on? She's like, oh, we're on a date, and, like, it was one of those moments where you feel like you're maybe making it weird, even though the whole thing's weird, but she won't tell me what's going on, and, I'm, and so we order our food, and, and when the food comes, my food comes on a tray. And my food are on these paper plates, the kind of paper plates you would use at a baby shower. Like they're covered in in pacifiers and bottles. And in the one corner of the tray is another paper plate with a Ziploc bag with a positive pregnancy test in it. Yeah. What seems so obvious to you at this moment was not to me, okay? I was like, what the crap is happening right now? Steak and Shake has lost their minds. That is a pea stick. That's disgusting, and it's near my food. Like, the whole thing was like waves washing over me of going like, wait, someone's pregnant. Wait, you're pregnant? Wait, we're pregnant? Like, what? It was the most wonderful 
news two weeks ahead of our first anniversary. It wasn't our timeline or our plan, but it's what God had for us. And over the next nine months, I watched the wonder of my wife growing another human life, my son. And that day came that no one, no one can help you be ready for. That moment, that wonder where I saw my son born for the first time to see him the inexplainable emotions that had overtaken me, the beauty and the wonder of this moment to see him, to hold him in that moment, if you've ever seen it, when they hand that, that newborn baby to that mother who has just gone through hell on earth. And those tears of joy as she holds and as she kisses that baby. It was absolutely the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen, I'd ever felt, I'd ever experienced. But unfortunately for my wife and I, three months later, we would go through the worst thing we had ever been through. Three months later, my past would catch up to me. Three months later, I would have to let my wife into the secrets of my life, the things that I had been running from and hiding from, things that happened to me when I was a kid that I never told anybody about, things that I was doing, sins I was participating in, all intending to keep from her. And like an avalanche, it all just came crashing down on us and we were just decimated. To have the most like wonderful moment removed by just three months from the worst moment of our life, that, that's just life. But to this day, my wife and I know that God gave us that wonderful moment and that baby boy to carry us. Because when we were our ugliest, when we felt hopeless, when we were at our worst, when we felt like there was no way forward, you couldn't hold that baby and not be reminded of something bigger pointed to something better, pointed to a, a higher hope and a better focus for our life and for ourselves and for our marriage. Now, thankfully for many of you in this room, you do not have to have a baby this Christmas to experience that. Thank God, right? Because that is why this baby was born for you. So right now in the midst of your hopelessness, your struggle, that pain that you've been carrying, you can be reminded that a baby was born to give you a higher focus and a stronger foundation to stand upon because this was the anointed one who came to win this war and give you and I the ability to live from a place of victory, to fight from a place of victory, to hope not in ourselves and not in our strength and in our ability, but in the one who has already overcome. And that way at our ugliest and our moments of hopelessness, he would draw our attention and draw our hearts to hope and to, and to trust him, not ourselves. So like, I, I don't know what this all means for you today. I just know this moment right now is a moment where every one of us has an invitation from God to take a step closer to him. So I wanna invite you into a time that we call encounter. It's a space we create at the end of our services if you're new to just say, hey, we're going to